to a science communication webinar series created by the Medical Genomics graduate students at the University of Toronto. I would first like to introduce you to our esteemed creators, Luis, Patricia, and myself, Patricia. Before we begin, we would first like to start with a land acknowledgement, as the land we are meeting on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and it is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Today, we are all excited to share with you an intriguing topic in the realm of medicine and genetics. The focus of this webinar will be about mitochondrial replacement therapy and the pioneer advancements in reproductive medicine. By the end, we hope that you will have an understanding of what mitochondrial transfer is, how it works, and its applications in healthcare and disease prevention. To start off, we need to go back, way back, to approximately 2 billion years ago. At this time, a primitive proteobacterium became engulfed by a prokaryotic cell, leading to one of the most enduring symbiotic relationships in biological history. This proteobacterium functioned as an organelle, which is a subcellular structure that has a specific job to perform in the cell, much like an organ does in the body. This organelle eventually became the mitochondria. The number of mitochondria in a cell depends on how much energy that cell needs to produce. Muscle cells, for example, have many mitochondria because they need to produce energy to move the body. Red blood cells, on the other hand, which carry oxygen to other cells, have none because they don't need to produce their own energy. The mitochondria, as we might all remember, is a powerhouse of the cell. It supplies all the energy that the cell needs to function and perform its duty to keep everything in working order. If the nucleus of the cell is like the head office with all the blueprints, then the mitochondria is the generator that powers the building. To understand the importance of the mitochondria and how it works, we need to take a peek inside and see what happens inside those double membrane walls. Looking at the outside in, we see that the organelle has an outer membrane that covers the surface of the mitochondria, while the inner membrane is located within and has many folds called cristi. The folds increase the surface area for chemical reactions, increasing the mitochondria's output. The space between the outer and the inner membranes is called the intermembrane space, and the space inside the inner membrane is called the matrix. Represented by the white circles, we have the ribosomes. These are structures comprised of two subunits that work together to synthesize the information provided by the mitochondrial DNA and turn that information into proteins that will be used for various metabolic processes. Next, the F sub 0 and F sub 1 complexes are enzyme complexes whose job is to harness energy from a gradient of protons, or sodium ions in some bacteria, across the membrane to synthesize energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. Lastly, and most importantly, we have our mitochondrial DNA, commonly referred to as mtDNA. Unlike normal nuclear DNA that most people are used to, the mitochondrial DNA is circular. Mitochondria are characterized by the presence of several functional circular DNA molecules. The genetic makeup of a human mitochondrion features 37 genes that code for peptides, transfer RNAs, and ribosomes. The mitochondria rely on complex interactions with the host cell as most of their protein components are encoded by the nuclear DNA. The multiple copies of genetic information in the mitochondria are prone to mutations and show about 1,000 times higher mutation rate than normal nuclear DNA. This high rate is due to endogenous, internal, and exogenous, external sources. It is these mutations that are responsible for mitochondrial-related disorders. Looking at normal nuclear DNA, where half is inherited from mom and the other from dad, mitochondria are transmitted through the maternal lineage only. So if we look at a family tree and see that we have a grandmother with a mitochondrial disease, this disease will be passed down to both of her children. But out of her two children, only her daughter's children will show symptoms of the mitochondrial disease because of the maternal lineage inheritance. So even though the grandmother's son carries the affected mitochondria, his children will not present the disease symptoms because they have received healthy mitochondria from their own mother. There are two ways that mutations can be present in the mitochondria. 
Either the mutation is passed down from an affected female, as we saw in the family tree, or mutations in the mitochondrial genome can be acquired de novo. A de novo mutation is a genetic alteration that is present for the first time in one family member as a result of a variant or mutation in an egg or sperm cell of one of the parents. The terms homoplasmy and heteroplasmy refer to the presence of one or more multiple mitochondrial genomes and functionality in a single cell respectively. The cell on the left shows a homoplastic view of the mitochondria, while the cell on the right shows a mixed or heteroplasmic view. The cell has the ability to tolerate some malfunctioning mitochondria, but when that number gets too high, we reach a limit called the biological threshold. This means that a cell can no longer work and function properly and disease symptoms start to become more prominent. It is estimated that mitochondrial DNA conditions affect between 1 in 3,500 to 1 in 10,000 individuals. Mitochondrial diseases are multisystemic, and their diagnosis is complicated due to the intense network of metabolic pathways that can be affected. Mitochondrial DNA diseases show high variability in penetrance, which describes whether there is a clinical expression of the genotype in the individual, and expressivity, which describes the differences observed in the clinical phenotype between two individuals with the same mutation. Both penetrance and expressivity contribute to a range of disease severity. Some of the more common symptoms of mitochondrial disease include muscle fatigue and weakness, and general exercise intolerance, gradual paralysis of the eyes and drooping of the eyelids, problems with hearing, cognitive impairments such as learning disabilities or delays in development, breathing problems, heart problems, and problems with the digestive system such as unexplained vomiting, cramping, or constipation. Currently, there is no cure available for any of these disorders, only palliative treatments to help with disease symptoms. So how do we help a family that is affected by a mitochondrial disease? The answer is a new innovative treatment called mitochondrial replacement therapy. The three techniques that we'll be looking at today are maternal spindle transfer, pronuclear transfer, and polar body transfer. All the methods try to lower the risk of transmitting mitochondrial DNA disorders by replacing the affected mitochondria from the mother with mitochondria from the donor's egg. The first method we will explore is a method called spindle transfer. With this technique, the patient's spindle apparatus containing nuclear DNA is isolated and introduced into a donor cell that has had its nuclear DNA removed. After a successful transfer, the new cell containing the patient's genetic information and donor mitochondria is fertilized with the partner's sperm. The fertilized cell is now able to grow with no hindrance from mutated MT DNA. This technique was tested in a patient with Lay syndrome, a mitochondrial DNA disease. The patient had about 28% pathogenic mitochondria in her cells. Spindle transfer was preferred as it represented less ethical complications for the couple because there is no embryo destruction. Only one of the five zygotes entered cell division and mitochondrial DNA sequencing showed a 5.7% heteroplasmy. After birth, the heteroplasmy levels varied in different tissues but overall scored a presence average of 6% pathogenic mitochondria and no symptoms of the disease. The pronuclear transfer, or PNT, technique is quite similar. We will start off with the patient's egg that has the affected mitochondria. However, we first fertilize the egg with the partner's sperm, resulting in a zygote with male and female pronuclei. The zygote stage in mammals is characterized by the presence of two pronuclei, each clearly visible and containing a haploid or half-chromosomal set of nuclear DNA from both the egg and the sperm. Next, the patient's pronuclei are transferred into a donor zygote that has had its pronuclei removed. This results in the patient's pronuclei present in a cell with healthy donor mitochondria. PNT was performed for a patient suspected of having a mitochondrial disease after two failed in vitro fertilization procedures. The eggs from the patient and the donor were fertilized with the partner's sperm and resulted in five viable zygotes. Three heartbeats were detected, but unfortunately none were carried to term. Genetic analysis of the fetus showed no abnormality and less than 2% carryover of the patient's affected mitochondria. 
confirming the feasibility of using PNT along with IVF treatments. Lastly, we will look at the polar body transfer technique, or PBT. During meiosis, the oocyte, or egg, undergoes a series of reductive cell divisions that results in the production of two small bodies with a full and half set of chromosomes, respectively. In PBT, the haploid polar body of the patient is transferred into an enucleated donor egg, called PB1, or to a fertilized zygote with one pronuclear removed, called PB2. This technique aims to complete the chromosome set required to produce a viable zygote. For the purposes of this technique, we will look at PB1 transfers only. Starting with the preparations of the donor egg, the donor nuclei DNA is removed from the cell. Next, we have a transfer and fusion of the first polar body into the prepared donor cell. Once fusion is successful, fertilization with the partner sperm takes place. This technique addresses mitochondrial carryover because polar bodies are so small and contain so little mitochondria that they can be easily handled and removed. So far, zygotes made with this technique have not been implanted, but studies have shown that they can grow to advanced developmental stages and have virtually no carryover. Each of the procedures mentioned has its own set of limitations and benefits, but how do these methods stack up against each other? Pause the video now to think about it before we go on to compare and contrast the methods we have just learned. For pronuclear transfer, the efficiency is affected by higher mtDNA carryover levels due to the inevitable co-transfer of a small amount of cytoplasm containing mitochondria and mtDNA when the pronuclei are removed from the affected zygote. In spindle transfer, the size of the spindle plays an integral role in the efficiency of the procedure. Due to its small size, when the spindle is exasperated, there is less carryover of mutated mtDNA to the donor cell with healthy mtDNA. But, the creation and destruction of zygotes may pose an ethical dilemma. In first place, we have the polar body transfer procedure. The PB transfer method holds the greatest potential as polar bodies contain only a few mitochondria and can be easily visualized and handled. This technique has only been tested on live pregnancies in mouse models namely the first generation born after treatment. Genetic analysis studies confirm that the first generation from polar body transfer possesses minimal donor mtDNA carryover compared to the first generation from other procedures. Moreover, the mtDNA genotype remains stable in the second generation progeny after polar body transfer. These studies demonstrate that polar body transfer has the greatest potential to prevent inherited mtDNA diseases. Although mitochondrial replacement therapy has still not made its way into the clinic in Canada, there are many efforts being made to make this type of assisted reproductive technology available for Canadians. Women with mitochondrial mutations are situated at a controversial regulatory, ethical, and social nexus. Because women with mitochondrial mutations are technically fertile, they are not afforded access to clinical infertility services nor are they included in the strong patient advocacy communities established to support such services. According to the Assisted Human Reproductive AHR Act in Canada, there is a criminal ban on using such technology which will alter the genome to descendants. But, in the strictest sense, a criminal ban may not be applicable to MRT considering there is no consensus on whether it should be classified as a germline modification. Criminal bans are not suitable instrument to regulate MRT. Justifications for upholding the current approach should be revised and new objective and mechanisms of future policy should be broached. As our time together is coming to an end today, let's look at what we have learned. We have learned about mitochondrial function and disease causes and symptoms. We have also looked at three techniques, spindle transfer, pronuclear transfer, and polar body transfer. Lastly, we have concluded with Canadian law and some future prospects in mitochondrial replacement therapies. But whether it be spindle, pronuclear, or polar body transfer, mitochondrial replacement therapies have the potential to support families and their goals for happy, healthy children. If you'd like to test yourself further or just recap on what you learned, head on over to the Kahoot game in the description box below. Thank you for sticking with us to the end and we really hope that you learned something new about mitochondrial replacement therapies.